CEO and co-founder at Snorkel AI, Ryan Treichler, VP of Product at Spectrum Labs, Krishna Gade, CEO and co-founder at Fiddler AI, Shane Orlick, President at Jasper, and Lucas Swisher, co-COO of Growth and general partner at Co2. Lucas will be moderating this conversation on opportunities for hypergrowth in Gen AI. Hello, everyone. Thank you for, uh, for joining all of us. Um, we are very excited to have a number of great uh, founders and execs here on this panel to discuss uh, hyperscaling in this current environment. Obviously, things move very quickly in AI these days. Every 30 seconds, we get a new press release or a new product announcement. And uh, I think we have four of the uh, sort of world's experts in and around this category that can help us think through some of the challenges around hyperscaling. So. Um, just to kick things off, I, I figured I'd open up a question for the, for the entire group. Um, there's obviously kind of a stack emerging around AI. You have the infrastructure layer, the language models, the tooling layer, all the way up to the application layer. I'm curious what folks think are some of the areas that need the most improvement or where there are the most opportunities and where folks think the value might accrue at the end of the day. Um, I guess I can, I can take a first crack at this. I'll try to be a little bit more uh, inflammatory to make this interesting, because the last, yeah. So you can move, moving fast, like three Gen AI panels this week, and then there's been too much agreement. So let me see if I can strike some interesting disagreement. So I think um, uh, there's an infrastructure layer, which uh, you know I'll, I'll be kind of broad bucket, includes everything from the hardware to the, 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 you know, the platforms for doing what we think of as model-centered development, training, et cetera. Um, and uh, then I think there's a critical data, data-centric layer. Uh, I'll, uh, uh, um, am I supposed to introduce myself or? No, go for it. <laughs> okay, so if you look me up, you'll see where my bias is around what we call data-centric AI. But um, uh, that data layer um, is relevant for both generative, but also what we often call predictive AI. Some of the labeling, classifying, tagging that you know traditional business value is is based on. Um, and then you've got kind of application layer, which for predictive often looks like traditional ML ops. For generative, it's a whole new set of kind of co-pilot style stacks and other ones that we're still inventing. But you know, I'll make a you know a more declarative claim that you know everything but the data layer and maybe the the, the UI layer for generative is effectively commoditized. Um, the models, the algorithms, the infrastructure for for basic stuff, all but the most specialized bespoke edge use cases. Um, it's all about the data these days. We're seeing tons of examples in the environment where you know. A, a language model, a large language model is released every like five seconds now. We're contributing to some of the open source ones. Um, you know, spend a couple hundred bucks and you can siphon off all of the, the learnings of, you know, a closed source model into the open source. Everyone's using the same models. Everyone's using the same algorithms. Uh, we released a paper um, I'm, I'm a, a affiliate faculty at University of Washington. One of my students there uh, with Apple and Google and Stability and Line, a bunch of others, we just released this benchmark called Data Comp. I'll, this is my last point, then I'll leave off. But um, we, we fixed everything in the code from uh, you know basic data lo loading to model architecture to training for a training a clip model. It's a multimodal image text model if, if for those that are familiar. And just by playing around with how the data is curated, filtered, clean, sampled, you get a new state of the art that at compute parity beats open AI, beats, beats everyone. So what's the point here? I guess my claim would be all the layers other than the data, and in particular, if you're interested in enterprise, the domain specific you know private enterprise data and knowledge. I think is either at or rapidly getting driven to commodity, which is awesome for the space. But it's interesting, let's say, for 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 you know hyperscaling when you're when you're not when you don't have some kind of advantage around unique data or knowledge. Yeah, um, I think I, I second that. I think the the other missing link and in the generative AI world is the the layer that can say you know pr provide safeguards and guardrails for you know responsible AI usage. Um, that's basically our mission. At, that has been our mission at Fiddler for the past four years, building trust and transparency into AI. Because I think generative AI is, if, if not even more magical than the predictive AI has been. And how do you make sure that you're taking care of safety and observability and, and ensure that the AI is, is serving in the society and serving your customers 
in in a in a trustworthy manner that's actually that's actually probably underinvested and probably would get invested because i don't think you know companies will productize ai apps without taking care of this issue because i think without without making sure that their ai apps are are trustworthy you know how, i don't think you know we will see real productization of ai products so that's what we've, that's what we have been working on and a shameless plug we've released a, an ai auditor last week to essentially do this stuff to audit uh, large language models um, third party models to you know look for correctness consistency and and safety issues here so that's 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 what we believe is the missing link cool yeah yeah i agree with uh, everything you said as well um, i guess today's a great day to be at nvidia at the infra layer <laughs> But I think there are just a handful of companies that are going to make a lot of money in that space. Uh, for us, you know, again, we're biased at Jasper. It's the application layer, the opportunity to come in and really revolutionize the way that enterprise software, in particular, the UIs work with customers. Um, we've been talking about productivity gains in enterprise software for the last 20 years, but in reality, we haven't really delivered on that. We've made things incrementally better, but I think AI, for the first time, really has an opportunity to transform the way people interact with the software they use every day in their job. So that's where I get most excited is how that's gonna transform the way people work. It's also the most noisy and picking the right solution and the right company to build or the right products to adopt is a real big challenge right now. Um, but that's where I get most excited. I'll just kind of bridge the first two comments. Like, So I also run a trust and safety company that's been in the space for a while. and. I definitely see the need for that in the market, but the, the thing that actually drives the ability to do that effectively is data. Like the only way to solve a lot of these problems is data, so I think it really does come back to that very first point that without that, everything else is kind of moot. Like. Yeah, I think that's that's a really good point. And, and Krisha, you kind of played into Ryan's point a little bit as well on the trust and safety piece, which I thought was I thought was interesting. Um, Shane, a little bit to Alex's point in question, you all, obviously have a lot of models on the back end of Jasper that you either play with or put in production. And I'm curious, what's your, what are your thoughts on kind of the open source models versus the proprietary models? Uh, what do you think about the sort of similarities and differences? What do you all prefer? Do you think that he's right about the commoditization aspect? Yeah, so I, I'm a huge fan of innovation, obviously. So anything that people are working on that brings additional technology into the world, uh, as long as it's safe, as long as it's unbiased, as long as, <laughs> you know, it's differentiated from all the other models. I'm a huge fan of that. At Jasper, we realized very quickly that it wasn't gonna be just a single model that was gonna win. We actually started probably the first year of our life as a wrapper on OpenAI, but then our customers were asking for different things, different experiences, different use cases, and so we actually built a really open AI engine that plugs into all the different models. So the more models for us, the better. Again, as long as they're safe, as long as they add differentiated experiences, we even built our own models, small models, really finely tuned, uh, that are outperforming the large models. So for us, um, you know, we're totally open, but the more the better, as long as uh, you know, they're, they're headed in the right spot. Got it, great, thank you. Um, what do you all think are the most overrated growth opportunities and underrated growth opportunities in and around the generative AI stack? I can, I can go first. I have maybe this is a you know controversial thing. I do think, as I, I, in somewhat aligned to what Alex was saying, the large the large language models, like the, the people who have been training and investing millions of dollars in training these models. That's where I don't know if there is going to be a long-term moat, yeah. because I think, you know, eventually, uh, you know, we're already seeing that uh, you can get get away with like smaller language models on domain-specific data sets, and get comparable or even better performances. So I think uh, a lot of investments have happened in the last few months on several different uh, companies building LLMs for something. That's that's where I'm doubtful. Yeah, I'll, I'll plus one that, and, and I, I don't, I mean, I say it with a note of sadness because I think that some of the companies that are, you know, most known in the space and heavily invested for kind of building a large language model or foundation model um, deserve a ton of credit for, you know, pushing this whole field forward um, and pushing the practical progress of scaling these models up forward. Um, but I, I, I do think there's an overestimation of how much value they're going to capture when, you know, I, I think there's a, 
there's going to be some winners. So I think generalist versus specialist is a helpful, uh, helpful axis. Um, I, I think there's going to be some, you know, small one or two winners for kind of general commodity co or ge general uh, consumer use cases. Basically, what you can soak up from the internet and, you, and, and user feedback flywheels. And I think that'll be a, a winner takes all because it's really all about the data and it's about the flywheel you can collect and that kind of tends to be exponential and, 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 and you know, more uh, one winner takes everything. And then for everything specialized where you actually have, you know, specific tasks you want to do really well at, we've already reached, in my opinion, the saturation point where, you know, taking a, an open source base or I was just at Microsoft Build yesterday or the day before, so I should say hosted. So we're not anti-Microsoft, uh, one of our great partners. Um, hosted models and just fine tuning with your own data and knowledge on top of it or prompting or th th these things are all gonna converge, basically teaching the model on top. That is already gonna beat the performance. You can, you can if you have a really specialized task, you wanna get the production level accuracy. You can do that with a you know, log logistic regression, 100,000 million times smaller can beat you know, a GPT-4 if it's trained in the right way already. So I think specialists, which is where a lot of the value lies, we've already reached the saturation point where good enough is fairly commoditized. And then you get to what, what, what you know, Shane said of just all these different specialized models that you tune and build based on user feedback, and that's the value. So I'd say overrated, uh, overrated is all but maybe one or two of the, the big closed source models. And underrated, I'd say, let me, I'm trying to be controversial. We're all agreeing with each other. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go with a, a, a controversy through, 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 uh, through boringness. Uh, um, Incumbents. I think incumbents, you know, large companies that are vertical specific and are sitting on lots of specialized data and, and existing workflows and users are going to benefit a ton from this trend because they're going to take in the open source progress and then they're going to opera operationalize all that, that data and, and knowledge. And, you know, we build a development platform for what we call data centric AI, all this, this labeling, but also data curation and collection for training these models. So we're trying to sell these incumbents the platforms to do this on their own, but I think they're uh, underrated in this space in terms of the, you know, who wins from this tech shift. Great, thank you. Um, Alex, you've talked a lot about how data bottlenecks can get in the way of enterprises actually being able to get to the power of these AI models. What in general do you think are the big barriers in that missing link of the last mile of actually getting AI into production? Because we talk a lot about you know, AI in production and we don't see a lot of it quite yet. There are a lot of amazing demos out there but how do you actually get that into production and live for millions of users? And what are the biggest bottlenecks? Yeah, it's a, a great question. And, and I want to start by saying that, like, you know, despite some of our marketing phrasing where we say data is the bottleneck, right? It's, it, it's actually well represented by this panel. I mean, it's, it's explainability and interpretability. It's, it's the right UI uh, interface, especially for these new generative paradigms where we're inventing new ones by the day beyond just, you know, run a model prediction. It's trust and, 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 and safety. And so uh, there are lots of these practical bottlenecks, uh, especially in you know, larger uh, you know, regulated industries, for example, you know, banks, uh, government, healthcare, et cetera. Um, but data is a lot, uh, you know, uh, across all these verticals is definitely one that, that often um, is, is what stops getting from the proverbial 80% to like 90, 95, 99 for production. So, you know, one of the things that, the ways that we've been talking about it, so, um, uh, my co-founder, Chris Ray, is a professor at Stanford and helped uh, found the Stanford Center for Research on Foundation Models. One of the reasons why we say foundation model, one, they're not just language, so it's any graph structure, any data, not just chains of, of tokens. Two, it's not just gen AI, it's, predict it's you know, boring old predictive AI use cases get built on top of these. But number three, it's that these are usually first mile tools. They get you to the 80% uh, use case for most non-trivial tasks that are not on kind of, you know, easy tasks on web data, you know, trying to do extraction from some documents in a bank or, or, you know, something from satellite images at a government agency, like all these bespoke use cases, these things are a st an order of magnitude improvement in first mile, but the last mile is still what blocks you from getting to production. Most enterprises can't ship a model that gets only 80% accuracy, at least outside of a co-pilot type paradigm, um, which is still new. So how do you get from 80 to 90 to 95 to 99? It's all about teaching the model with data. So you'll hear about fine tuning, instruction tuning, RLHF, uh, prompting, uh, you know, all of this kind of converges. It's really just about the, the labeled curated data that you put into the model to teach it about this task. And that's where you get blocked because guess what? The data science teams are usually not the team that can do this. 
So usually, you know, common story is data science team is begging some line of business partners at a bank, a pharma, health, uh, you know, an insurance company, could you please label like 10,000 more documents? Um, and, and that's what you see like quarters worth of blockage, uh, uh, you know, happen around. Um, so obviously that's our mission is to speed that up, but in general, I just think it's an underappreciated bottleneck. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, one of the other bottlenecks obviously is trust and safety, right? You think about the absolute explosion of content that's emerged over the last couple of years as you're able to generate basically infinite content. Ryan, how do you think about trust and safety when it comes to this new era of content generation, both a text generation, but also image generation, video generation, all the different modalities? It, it's been really interesting to watch and to talk to companies about how difficult trust and safety has been. It had been like, hey, I'm going to say something bad and you have to detect that. And now it's looking at, I'm going to prompt the model to do something bad. So the, the difference is, you know, we historically looked for is this adult trying to groom a child? And there's things that we could look and detect patterns in that and find that. And now what we're seeing is, you know, people using generative AI to try and create child grooming imagery or, or really, really toxic stuff by manipulating things that are out there and doing it in a way that circumvents the, the established protocols. And so in the trust and safety space, generative AI has just made it a lot easier for people to circumvent the tools that are already there. Uh, fortunately, Generative AI is actually one of the tools that we can use to, to kind of come back and help combat it. So we use that to create synthetic data sets, to create larger models that, that make it easier to detect these things. So we're seeing it be both the source of the problem and the source of the thing that we can use to go combat the thing because we're, we're able to, to use generative AI to create the, create the actual things that we're going to use to train models on to detect this stuff, but we do see an explosion of it. And we're actually waiting to see a bigger explosion. Like uh, the, my customers are consistently coming to me concerned about you know, a rapid growth and propagation of really, really harmful content that's being that could be created by generative AI. We haven't seen it yet, but everybody is kind of bracing for it. This is the you know, con concern that this is gonna make spear phishing a lot more effective. It's going to make a lot of these really, really toxic, harmful things where there is legitimate harms to people uh, more accessible. If you, you make it easier to create manifestos to recruit people into radicalization, to recruit people into that, there, there's a lot of potentially really harmful stuff that could be out there. And so we see uh, consistent requests for people looking for ways to identify that. And then beyond just the like the top level stuff there there's a whole nother surface there's a, a deeper level of looking at bias in the data underneath that's been used in this so you know as you get into some of these foundational models you can look at open ai and see where they've put guardrails in to protect against certain things but there is inherent bias in a lot of the data that was used to train these models and that to me is almost what's scarier for 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 stuff to come out like if i it's one thing for me to say, hey, I want to create a bad picture or write a poem that praises Hitler. That's bad. I don't want to do that. But like, it's a whole nother thing to say, like, how do you detect that if I ask this thing about a question about gender and say, you know, a, a nurse and a doctor are pregnant, who's pregnant, and it always detects the doctor and says the doctor is, or always says the nurse, but it's, it, then you have these inherent biases based on the training data that come out. And I think what's scary is how are those things going to manifest if you're not, not looking for them and detecting? So there's work that's gotta be done on the underlying training data to look for those biases, to remove them, to prevent further harm that's not even really intended with the stuff that's there. And Ryan, I think you just made a pitch for uh, Krisha's startup, but um, Krisha, how do you think about that problem and how we might be able to solve some of the kind of bias Absolutely, you know, so I think there are two things here, right? One is productization of trustworthy generative AI apps or any AI apps require companies to invest in infrastructure for ML. I mean, we have, you know, when we started Fiddler, you know, we were evangelizing explainability and observability for traditional machine learning models and, and companies had to build all of this ML infrastructure around versioning of the models and governance around models, looking into how models are performing and Fast forward four years, we still have a lot of companies who have not even started on this journey. Now, LLMs have dropped, and now this whole LLM ops, which is probably MLOps 2.0, 
where you have to build all of this infrastructure to productize it. So without taking care of these issues around you know, observability or setting perimeter controls around how the model is going to do and looking for bias and safety issues, it's going to be very difficult, at least in certain segments that we operate in financial services, healthcare, or HR, where in there, there are regulations that, that probably will come soon, where you, know, you need to have trustworthy AI apps. So uh, you know, there's no silver bullet. Uh, it just requires work. I was recently on a panel with you know P the great Peter Norwig was 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 saying that you know in, our, in order to build a working trustworthy ML applications you just have to put in the work you just have to make sure that the model works better on your test data uh, before you launch it you ha you understand how the model works and you are monitoring it continuously you you have alerts when things go wrong you, you just have to do all of these things and it's it's not it's not a free lunch uh, uh, to get that ROI. And, and just to tack on quickly, f first of all, plus one, uh, uh, you know, to Ryan's points about the, the danger here. I mean, I think some of these more quote unquote pedestrian dangers beneath like Skynet taking over of just mass scale disinformation and, and, and uh, you know, uh, other things like that. I mean, it's, it's, it's really exploding and it, ha it seems like it has the potential to explode much more than that. I was on a panel like a year and a half ago at uh, Google Ads AI internal conference and I kept getting questions from folks there about like, uh, uh, what happens when you know the web is filled with with auto-generated content? I was like, what are what are these people asking about? Like, this seems very sci-fi. I thought I was gonna get nerdy questions about like loss functions and stuff like that. Uh, but no, I mean, like, yeah, they they were right. Uh, uh, um, uh, this stuff is real. Um, and then I think the point also is just it, it it does come down to the data. Just I gotta take the bait and and uh, yeah, because you know I gotta I gotta stick to our our stick. Um, but that is that is something that's critical. And I think w one one. One thing I like to point out, I think, it is is a little helpful, is like people talk about biases, they talk about hallucinations, is the the new the new term du jour, and it's it's true. I mean, there was a paper that came out last night or two nights ago, just a, you know one of the NLP conferences that just looks at factuality. If you ask ChatGPT or GPT four, and then you cross check it on Wikipedia, and you just look at all the atomic statements of that it says and how many of them are right, and GPT four is like forty eight percent, and you can help with retrieval and and and. Uh, uh, and there's all kinds of things there, but still, you know, this is real, biases are real, but I think it's worth accentuating. One of the reasons actually I don't like the term hallucination is it, it seems like mystical or emergent or surprising. It's not at all surprising. These models were never trained to do some kind of task or an answer some kind of question in a factual and bias-free way. They were trained to present statistically plausible completions of prompts based on the data set that you randomly cobbled together and they soaked up. So to, it's, it's not at all surprising to get these things to actually work bias-free, error-free in specific settings, surprise, surprise, you need to actually put some intentionality into the data at all stages that go into the models. Right? They're just counting machines on top. It's been the same for decades. So um, I think that's, a, that's a, a plus one to those points, but also just there's no mysticism around it. It's just it's a missing step in the things you have to do to get serious with AI deployment is get the data right. Yep. Um, changing gears just a little bit, you're all part of companies that are extraordinarily fast growing, both in terms of headcount and metrics and all of these things. How, what sort of organizational challenges have you all experienced and how do you keep your teams focused? How do you keep attracting the best talent, retaining the best talent? And maybe most important in this environment, how do you keep innovating when things are moving so quickly? Yeah, it's so exciting to hear everybody talking about this final mile problem. You know, it's like autonomous vehicles, the last 10% is 90%. And so we've been doing generative AI for the last two and a half years, which doesn't seem like a long time, but in reality, it was two years you know, before ChatGPT. And so we rolled out generic AI and content creation was this big wow moment for a lot of people. And, um, and that played for a year and we got bored of it, our customers got bored of it. And so we started really focusing on what do our customers want? What do they need? How do we actually make their lives better? And it turns out it's not just content creation, it's actually you know, distributing it in the right mechanism, it's analyzing it, it's improving, it's this whole chain around this problem. And so by solving that problem, we're able to attract the most talented people because we're not just solving this high level generic, hey, we're putting an API in our product and now we're an AI company. 
you know, we're actually solving real problems for real customers and, and making their lives better. And at the end of the day right now, I think if you're an AI company, we're all fighting for talent. It's not ideas. There's a million ideas in this room. Uh, it's not money. There's a lot of that if you have the right idea. It's talent. It's the people that are going to actually go execute that final mile, that final problem, and care passionately about the problem that they're solving. And so by focusing on our customers, we've been able to go get good people. And once you have good people, and if you just listen, uh, the rest sort of unfolds. But it's exciting to see people go beyond just like, we put an API link in our product and the stock went up 20% into like, okay, who cares? Like, how are people actually gonna improve their, you know, the way they work or the way they live because of this? Just a quick plus one. I mean, it, it brings up a point, um, uh, it, like even evaluation, uh, of, of, of how accurate are we doing with these new gen AI, let alone how that maps to real ROI or business value, is a legitimate technical challenge these days. And so, you know, I mean, I, I think that says a lot about the state of where we are of, you know, like, uh, uh, we're still even struggling to understand how to measure that. Like, totally. at least it's, it, it, you know, you gotta do that before you can really get serious about improving it. But it's, it, it, we are kind of in that phase where we have to uh, uh, move to that. Um, because I jumped in, I guess I'll give a quick answer. Um, I think uh, I think there's all the standard challenges of, of just growing quickly uh, that are just about organizational m maturation, right? And there's others who can speak far more. I mean, you know, maturing a sales uh, uh, org uh, from you know founder-led, which is very helpful in, in a technically fast-changing space, to something that has a rigorous process around assessing both technical and business value and alignment and et cetera. You know, uh, uh, building up the product and engineering org. People like to hack, and there's a lot of I think in terms of talent wars, there's a lot of you know excitement about, oh, I'll go do a three-person Gen AI seed startup and just like, I can hack together a demo that gets to that proverbial 80% it looks awesome in like 24 hours or less, or 15 minutes, frankly. And then, then, you know, how do you keep people like that excited working on real systems that, you know, take a little bit more than 15 minutes of hacking and not all is, you know, glory on Twitter. And so I think, um, that, that's one thing that we think about a lot, and it is accentuated by the fact that we sell to enterprise customers. We work with five of the top 10 US banks and government agencies and large insurers and healthcare uh, organizations. And so how do you kind of bridge for both our internal teams who want to be hacking on cool stuff, and frankly, for our customers who are data scientists who, even though they sit inside these behemoth organizations, are also watching the same Twitter threads. How do you kind of keep that balance between innovation in a very fast-moving space while also doing all the kind of, you know, our, our, I was just on a call with our post-sales lead, you know, called it the, the boring stuff. Uh, all the boring stuff of, you know, enterprise readiness and performance and stability and the last mile and all that kind of stuff. And so I think it's, I don't have a perfect answer. I think it's just that constant balance between doing the new stuff, but also staying grounded in the stuff that actually matters. I mean, 80% of our customer base, 100% of our customer base in our, like in the, f you know, Fortune 1000, uh, is not using foundation models in production. And it probably isn't going to for their critical high value applications for at least a year or two, if not longer in some regulated industry. So how do you, how do you keep serving that, you know, those more basic pragmatic kind of enterprise goals while also being exciting enough internally and externally with all the new stuff? Um, just about balance, you know, but, but it's, it's uh, I think one of the challenges in, in this space for AI companies. I think I was talking to one of our banking customers and on one side we're looking into how do we evaluate and audit LLMs and this banking customer has a simple NLP based chatbot that uses a decision tree based uh, routing mechanism and they're asking can we monitor the feedback that we get from, from our users and, and, and they don't have any basic monitoring to, to know how many times the chatbot is actually working well for them. So. I think, yeah, there is a vast difference in terms of, you know, AI maturity and, and across the board, right? And, and, and I, I mean, especially AI startups like that, you know, there's the innovation part of it, but there's like, you know, come to Jesus, like the, the real <laughs> bread and butter business, you have to do a lot of basic things right. Building on the stuff that, that Alex said, one of the things that we kind of run into is, you know, it is really easy, particularly with LLMs, to, to get an experiment out and to do something in five, 10 minutes. But turning that, oftentimes when we start looking at the results, it's like, wow, on the surface, this looks really good. And then we start probing, it's like, nope, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. And then you start seeing 
like, oh man, there's, there's all kinds of issues that need to be addressed. Like particularly we found weird stuff when you go across languages and things like that. And so the ability to take that initial experiment and then do all the work that turns it into something that's valuable uh, can sometimes be difficult because people will get sidetracked. They're like, hey, you did the thing in five minutes and showed that it worked. Like now it's gonna take a month and a half to get it into to production. That there's not always appetite to do that. I think we also sometimes struggle with the, the difference between shiny object and paradigm shift, where you're looking and saying like, wow, is this, this a major change that's actually gonna be really valuable that we need to invest time in? Or is this just something that's novel that's not really gonna have move a needle? And when you have a lot of creative, talented people that like to go hack stuff, they will run away with shiny object stuff. Uh, that may not be a paradigm shift, and so you, making sure that people stay focused on that while giving them the, the creativity to actually explore so you d that you don't miss any of those big things is, is another important thing that we find. I think that's a, it's a really important point. How, and I'm curious for the group, how do you, whenever things are moving so quickly and everything affects everyone in this room, how do you prioritize from a product perspective your own roadmap that's your own vision versus while incorporating what else is happening out in the ecosystem? Like how do those things interact and how do you prioritize? Yeah, so for us, uh, we wanna move quickly but deliberately. And so uh, it doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to be fast. And then we look and see where the adoption comes from our customers and we'll invest more there. But we sort of have shifted into this more structured, predictive, uh, you know, environment because before we would just run a bunch of experiments because it is, it's so easy, it's so quick, you can throw it out. The problem is you don't know exactly which one worked. And so now we actually have a, the other thing is we're investing heavily in a growth team. So that's their whole function and they sit cross-functionally across product, engineering, sales, marketing, the whole, um, the whole spectrum. So they're just trying to look at funnel metrics. But for us, like we actually have now a spreadsheet. We have 20, over 20 experiments that we're running. We make people commit to what problem is that experiment trying to solve? Is it reducing churn? Is it increasing expansion, increasing engagement? You know, what, what do they think the point of this experiment really is? And then they, we make them assign a number, a projection of the impact, and then we prioritize from there. And so um, success, Ma masks a lot of those things. And it's really easy in this environment if you're an AI company to grow really quickly and to get a lot of customers or get a lot of money or get a lot of traction or start to believe your own you know, hype. Um, and so for us, we got a little bit ahead of our skis there and we had to just sort of slow down and go back to some of the more fundamental basics, but it's had a big impact in the business. I think that point about experimentation and anchoring those experiments on, on you know, real metrics that tie to some end outcome or business value is is really uh, really a great one if, if I'm you know, <laughs> paraphrasing in an okay yeah, way yeah. but like you know we, we, the way we've tried to do this uh, I think so we, we built a platform for data centric AI called snorkel flow it's it's uh, for doing labeling and other data operations uh, programmatically and in a first class way rather than kind of you know second class manual processes that are treated as janitorial work that's the that's the that's the you know one of the one of the pitches but this is a it serves a very broad surface area because uh, any kind of model you might want to build including new newer generative applications there's some aspect of data labeling or curation that goes into getting it right and so for us it's really about how do we prioritize which use cases uh, we build around right we, we always had the horizontal layer but then you know, nothing in machine learning and AI, as much as we love to think it, is completely agnostic. Nothing is just vectors. It's it's use case specific, all the way to the collateral and enablement that you give your go-to-market teams when you're when you're when you're then getting to that side of things. So, we try to be very experimental about it, right? The whole you know, um, see if someone will pay for it, and then you know, uh, uh, learn from that. We try to actually have that be a down to how we structure some of our teams that sit between go-to-market and engineering. We try to have that be a continual thing, not just a one-time thing. So we'll you know put some stuff out there, either through the, the academic labs that we're affiliated with or, or, or just some open source demos like, like the other you know, Twitter hackers out there. And, and you know, that'll give us some proof of concept, but then we'll pick two or three design partners, we call them, for any new use case. And we'll go through the painful process of making sure they'll actually pay for it. And we'll only work with people who are gonna actually pay for it. And then we'll learn from that and validate before we ever kind of commit fully on the product side. So it's a bit slower and more painful sometimes, um, but uh, we think it gives us better actual data about where, where should we build when there's such a broad surface area. I, I, for us, but I think for a lot of AI companies these days, given how 
potentially broad the surface area of this, the, you know, that this technology enables is. Yeah, there, there's a marketing technique called painted door tests, which is exactly that, where you basically stand up a, a fake version of the product, you build web pages for it, and you, it, it kind of comes from retail where you could let somebody get all the way to the purchase funnel, they click purchase, and it's like, oh, it's out of stock, to validate that somebody's actually going to click buy on it. And so, you know, we use a lot of the same techniques to validate, hey, people are actually going to request information on it. There's a willingness to purchase before you actually go out and build the... I, I, I love that example. And, and you can, the thing is, I think you can design your product to facilitate this, right? So a lot of how we build our product, there's like an SDK, you know, a Python SDK notebook library layer, and then there's a UI layer. And so we can kind of do the, the marketing test just via Python SDK with a little bit more hands-on or advanced users and then graduate it based on data. So you, you can build your product to facilitate this kind of experimentation, I think, is a, uh, one, one learning at least we've, we've tried to build around. This has been fantastic. I think we have time for one, maybe two questions, um, if anyone has them. Perfect. Um, hi, my name is Konstantin Bayendin. I'm founder of Stom AI. Uh, and I have a question about this uh, hyper growth in Gen AI, um, where to start a new company for a founder in this field. And I really love this uh, concept of, you know, uh, creating value in uh, general models, you know, for mass market versus building some product for um, vertical applications for existing incumbent players. And the key concept of, you know, collecting the data um, and who owns the data will be, you know, um, have a competitive advantage um, in that game. So I see that there is a, a spectrum of things you can do as a, as a founder, as a, an entrepreneur, and you'll have a different go-to-market model. So on one side, these are companies like Jasper, you know, who could demonstrate the value to the customer like in five minutes. Like you click on this uh, ad about the robot writing the ad and then you take a trial and you see the magic, oh yeah, 50 bucks per month, I I'm buying it. And then y you have this, you know, really quick product-led growth, right? On the other spectrum, you have dinosaurs, I'm sorry to say that, like, large companies like who own verticals, who have a lot of uh, data inside, but their cycles are like not months, but years. Like you, you, you as, a, as an entrepreneur, you, you'll spend a lot of time, you know, long experiments to, you know, understand what works, what doesn't. So in your opinion, like, and both of these uh, sides of the spectrum have advantages and disadvantages. What do you believe more in, in on that spectrum? Where we'll see more unicorns, more value created? Um, or, it's, or these two sides are equal? So here, I'll take a stab at this first. Uh, before Jasper, I was historically an enterprise person. So the organizations that I was a part of were mostly enterprise motion. So that long uh, sales cycle that you're talking about. With Jasper, we have this product-led growth engine that actually is now feeding our enterprise motion. So my short answer is both. If you can create this flywheel effect, even if it's not your full product, but just this way to do lead gen and to get people in the door, I love what you said about that trial. And like that's literally what our freemium product does and what the self-service product does, that the product for 50 bucks on the website, or it's now 29, uh, up to 99. But uh, for that product, if you want to just go use that, that's kind of that single player motion and maybe it goes to four or five seats. And then once it gets to 10, it gets to the departmental enterprise motion. It goes into a sales organization with a CS team, with a marketing, you know, dedicated marketing um, team that, that helps them. So if you can feed them, it's a lot better. At Walk Me, which was my last company, um, we had 90 BDRs just making cold calls, trying to get meetings for the sales team to start those engagements. And it's really expensive, it's really slow. I think by the time you get into that, this whole AI thing is gonna, you know, it'll be like to a whole nother point, the product that you built, you, you'll probably miss it. Um, so I think you need to have both. I'd agree with that, but I think if you look, I think the last little bit of research I did, there were five or six unicorns outside of open AI in, the, in this space, um, Snorkel is one of them, and they all have a PLG component to it. So like, I, I think if you're going to do this without product-led growth and just try and do enterprise, I think you're really selling yourself short and you're gonna, you're gonna have a hard time capturing market share because so many people have made it so easy to just go do this, to go try. It's, it's, really, it's really difficult to just 
put people through an enterprise motion if they can go to your competitors and try for free or try for a really low dollar. It's too slow. You might miss it. And by the time you've built that thing and you've got the, could, you know, some tweet came out that somebody built what you built and it's out of the box and they can just download it and use it. Um, and, and again, we're, like, we're one of those unicorns, like we're lucky, but we're not, that doesn't mean anything today, right? How are we going to be relevant in two years, three years, four years, five years? Like that's what we're really trying to focus on. And so that's where that PLG motion keeps you in front of your customers and just listen to them. They'll tell you what to build, but you need to build something that's like unique and important enough to those customers that they'll pay you hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars over time. And that's where you probably do need a, a heavier enterprise team. Got it. Thank you. Um, that's all, all the time that we had was for that one question, but I uh, appreciate everyone coming out, and uh, thank you to the rest of the panelists. Thank you. Thank you.